continuing in our series called The Perfect Person of God, a study in the Gospel according to Matthew. Today we're going to be in uh, chapter 4, uh, but uh, before we get to chapter 4, I'd like to just go over a couple of uh, review points. We've been talking throughout this uh, the last six weeks this idea that uh, the guiding principle of Matthew's presentation of Jesus is that Jesus is presented as the perfect Israelite, the perfect man or person of God, and the promised king of Israel. So you've got this kingdom motif, you've got this uh, person, uh, the, the people of God kind of motif as well, and as a result, Matthew then wants to show Jesus' followers, including us, what it means to live as people in God's kingdom. What does it mean to live into this kingdom, and what does that kingdom actually like? One of the ways that Matthew uh, kind of unpacks this guiding principle is through this use of Old Testament fulfillment. We saw this over and over and over again. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, Jesus is not the prime actor in the narrative, and yet he's the central focus of that narrative. The consistent theme is that it's not just the ministry of Jesus, but the life of Jesus That is fulfillment of old covenant promises and prophecies. Jesus' life and ministry then is a projection of the covenant relationship with the Old Testament people of God, but it's meant to resonate and transform the New Testament or the new covenant people of God. It's it's to have an impact on us as the new covenant people of God. We see this even in the genealogy section. The announcement of Jesus' birth to Joseph the visit of the Magi. Jesus is is shown as the Messiah of the Jews, the king who was anticipated for for centuries by the Israelite people. And at the same time, there are these echoes of Gentile inclusion, which then explodes in the first century church. Again, we looked at when you look at just the genealogies, there, the genealogy of Jesus, there is the inclusion of Gentiles in the genealogy of the Jewish Messiah. There are stories built into the genealogy of scandalous characters. We saw the, the seeking of, of Jesus as an infant by the Magi. Were the Magi Jewish people? No, they were not Jewish people. They're from the east, from, from Assyria. They are Persians. Are they, are they employed in a very Jewish field? No, they're astrologers, which, by the way, was condemned in the Old Testament. And yet, God is utilizing these people to demonstrate that Jesus' advent is opening the door beyond the ethnic Jewish community. The preaching of John the Baptist points to the relevance of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God as a kingdom of freedom from sin and a turning of the tide as it relates to the righteous. Being righteous is something that you cannot earn, but is something that is given as a gift. And last week, or not last week, we didn't have class last week, the week before, we looked at the baptism of Jesus. And this theme of Old Testament fulfillment, New Testament promise, it continues in the baptism narrative. A new community is formed, one that Jesus inaugurates in his identification with sinners. Jesus identifies in the unrighteousness of sinners and thereby fulfills the righteousness of the law and proceeds to pass that righteousness to all those who repent and believe. The baptism of Jesus is also kind of an ordination of sorts. It, 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 be, it, begin, it gets him fully ready for his ministry. In the baptism, you see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together ready for the powerful ministry that is to come. I, I just um, Some of you guys like to do additional reading. Um, you're very well-read people, and so when I can, I like to recommend books to you. I do commend this book by N.T. Wright, How God became a king, the forgotten story of the Gospels. N.T. Wright really goes into a lot of detail about the 
the, the Jewishness of Jesus as king and what that means for non-Jewish Gentile believers. I think it's a really good book uh, about that, uh, about the, the impact of the life of Jesus. So we move to, now to Matthew chapter 4 and the temptation of Jesus. So let's, um, let's, let's read uh, Matthew chapter 4. And again, I, as, as always, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest, your foot, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it's written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Before we get into the crux of the narrative itself, the temptation is attested to in all four of the Gospels, but it's especially attested to in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, Mark's version is really brief. Jesus was tempted, and it says something about wild animals. That's basically the totality of the Gospel of Mark's version of the temptation. Matthew and Luke are a little bit more you know, fleshed out in the... Uh, the telling of the temptation story. Now, Mark's version and Matthew's version both place the temptation of Jesus immediately after the baptism. Jesus is baptized, and then he goes into the wilderness to be tempted. In Luke's version, Luke actually inserts the genealogy between the baptism and the temptation. Now, some people have wondered why. Now, part of the reason uh, I think it, uh, Luke does this is because Luke really wants to identify the temptation of Jesus with the temptation of Adam. You say, well, what does that have to do with the genealogy? Well, if you look at Luke's genealogy versus Matthew's genealogy, Matthew's genealogy only goes as far as Abraham. Abraham is the oldest a person in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew's gospel, whereas in Luke's gospel, Luke goes all the way back to the beginning, and actually he reverses the order. Um, Matthew starts with Abraham and then ends with Jesus. Uh, Luke starts with Jesus and then ends with Adam, and then the very next scene is the temptation in the wilderness. So Luke ties the temptation story in Genesis with the temptation of Jesus. Why? Well, Adam in his temptation, failed. What does Jesus do? He succeeds. And, and Paul actually builds an entire theology around Jesus as the second Adam. Where Adam failed, Jesus succeeds. Of course, that's not the priority of, of, of Matthew. Matthew is not as interested in looking at the, the relationship between Jesus and Adam. Not saying that Matthew doesn't think it's there, it's just that's not his focus. His focus is on Jesus and the historic people of God. Now, in all the narratives that talk about the, the temptation, the Holy Spirit is the driving force which brings Jesus to this moment. Notice it says, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In Luke, there's this kind of double move. Jesus is described as being filled with the Holy Spirit, and being led by the Holy Spirit. The language of the Holy Spirit's actions in Mark is a bit more forceful than the simple reading of Matthew and Luke. He's being driven by the Holy Spirit. Again, Mark's version is considerably uh, shorter. The fact that Jesus was led to the wilderness is, uh, is actually a fairly important detail when you think of Matthew's priority. 
the tie to the activity of Israel in the wilderness in their journeys is obvious. And we're going to see some other details throughout the temptation which point to this. But the Israelites wandered in the wilderness because of their lack of adherence to the law of God, to, the, to the, their trust in God, and their continual complaining in the book of Exodus and into the, the, the rest of the Pentateuch. Their continual complaining is the very reason it took them 40 years to get there. And they were tested over and over again, and they failed. L- listen to the language here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. So if you want to open this up, uh, I will just tell you this. If you want to open up Deuteronomy between 6 and 8, we're going to be flipping back and forth there a lot. And I'm not going to have any of it on the screen, so I'll, I'll mention things. But Deuteronomy 6 through 8 are really important as it relates to Jesus in the wilderness being tempted. But in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, now you remember the setup to Deuteronomy, right? So Moses is basically giving a series of sermons to the Israelite people before they enter the promised land. Now, is Moses going to get to enter the promised land? No. no, Moses does not enter the promised land. Does that first generation that's coming out of Egypt, do they get to enter the promised land? No. So what Moses is doing here is he's speaking to this, this group of people, some of which are going to the promised land, second generation, and some who aren't. And so he's writing to, or reading uh, or speaking to them, recounting their journey and how they got to where they are. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, Moses says this, You shall remember the way that the Lord your God has, listen, led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? That he might humble you, testing you to know what's in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. In this speech, Moses is commanding the next generation or commending the next generation to prepare to enter the promised land that they might adhere to the law of God, which their parents didn't do, while reminding them of God's provision and his testing throughout. The purpose is clear. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, in their wilderness wandering for 40 years, Jesus is there in the wilderness in order to be tested, to be tempted by the devil. Now we're going to get into the different ways uh, Satan is referred to in this, uh, this section in just a moment. But before Jesus is actually tested, in Matthew's Gospel, it says he fasts 40 days. Now, it's pretty straightforward. He fasts, and then he's tempted. In Luke's Gospel, the two uh, two events seem to exist simultaneously. In Luke's Gospel, it's while Jesus is fasting, he's being tempted over the course of 40 days. The importance of that timing is not super relevant, um, and we could just be misreading one or the other. But the idea that Jesus is fasting is very relevant. On the one hand, this sort of fast was also observed by Moses in the book of Exodus, in chapter 34, verse 28. We're not reading it, don't worry about it. I mean, you can write it down, you can read it later. But it's also mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 9. So you can write that down as well. Moses fasts for 40 days. This was associated also, uh, at this, this point, he's fasting before he's receiving the Ten Commandments, or as he's receiving the Ten Commandments. Elijah also fasts 40 days in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. Now this actually follows a moment of triumph for Elijah. Elijah has been challenged by the Baal prophets in the previous chapter, and God shows up in 1 Kings chapter 18, and he destroys the Baal prophets. But still, Elijah has to flee the murderous intentions of Jezebel and King Ahab, and this throws Elijah into an incredible depression where he fasts for 40 days, and and then God intervenes miraculously with provision. So the fast is really important because Jesus is set up as being an extension of Moses, an extension of Elijah. Typologically, Moses and Elijah point forward to the perfect person of God in Jesus, and now Jesus is living into that same role as well. So Matthew Mark and Luke are all kind of tying Jesus to these figures in the Old Testament. Now, 
The other actor in this narrative, the other character in this narrative, is Satan. Satan is referred to in various ways throughout this uh, passage. In the first place, he's called the devil, diablos in the Greek. Now this is associated with the accusational nature of Satan in general. It's the most common designation given to Satan in this chapter. If you look at places like Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, Revelation 12, 10, what is Satan's primary weapon? His primary weapon is lies and accusations. He lies about the people of God, slandering them before God himself. That's certainly the role that Satan plays in the book of Job. He, he, he slanders the motivations of Job. Job has great faith before the Lord, and what does Satan say? Well, he only has faith in you because you're good to him. You, know, you take everything away, and he's going to curse you to, a fa- his, 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 to your face. Satan is slandering, he's accusing Job of unrighteousness. Secondly, uh, Satan is also called the tempter in this passage. This is one who specifically examines another person or tests another person. Um, There are both positive and negative associations with this uh, moniker in the original language. Um, But here the idea is that Jesus is being tested. His temptation is not temptation for the sake of temptation, but a testing as to the veracity of, of his commitment to the mission of God. The Father has given Jesus a mission. This is a test of how closely Jesus aligns himself with that mission, how closely, how tightly he's going to hold on to it. Finally, Jesus addresses the devil as Satan. I've been saying Satan throughout this, but Jesus actually uh, calls the devil Satan in verse 10. Now, the way Jesus uses it and the way it's used throughout Scripture, it almost seems as though Satan is a proper name, which is how it's translated in pretty much every time it's used. Um, And it comes from an Aramaic and Greek word that is specifically adversarial in nature, meaning it could be applied to anyone who opposes another person. That person would be a Satan to you. If someone opposes you, you would say, that person is a Satan to you. Now, that would be a pretty big insult. If you said, yeah, you're my Satan, that would be bad. Um, Here, it's applied to Satan, the devil, because he opposes, he's the adversary of God. It's reserved, this term is reserved in the scriptures for that person or that entity which is the the leader of all evil spirits. Some dictionaries call him the prince of all evil spirits. Jesus' use here is of, I think, interesting, um, of interest because of his understanding and his familiarity with the schemes that Satan will use to tempt him and his people. So you get this kind of rotation of designations throughout these these verses as well. And then you get the actual temptations themselves. Now, the temptations follow a, a, a threefold pattern. And it's interesting, one of the, um, one of the mosaics, it's like a Byzantine mosaic, I think it's Byzantine, now I've forgotten. But you can actually see the three temptations uh, kind of in this passage, right? You've got Jesus being tempted with bread. You've got Jesus uh, uh, being tempted on, on the, the top of the temple. You've got Jesus being tempted on top of the mountain and then the ministry of the angels at the end. So the temptations are kind of represented in that scene. Now, the three movements of the temptation are related to the, the passage that we just read from Deuteronomy chapter 8. God led the Israelites into the wilderness to test them. And all of Jesus' responses, all of Jesus' responses to Satan are from Scripture. Specifically, they're from Deuteronomy 6 through 8. Every single one of them comes from this portion of of the law and the the preaching the sermon of Moses. The purpose of those responses then underscores how Jesus used the very law which the people had failed to adhere to. Where where the people of God had failed 
to commit themselves to the law, Jesus is actually using the law of God to combat temptation. It's a very important uh, battle in the war of temptation. So the fulfillment motif is then metaphorically and actually unpacked in this temptation experience. We get this fulfillment cycle throughout the responses of Jesus. Now this is also important as it relates to the types of temptation that Satan brings to Jesus. So in the first place, the first and second temptations are directly tied to the preceding scene of Jesus' baptism. You'll remember, what does the voice of, of the Father say at the baptism of Jesus? What does he say? This is my son, right? In whom I'm well pleased. This is my son. And what are, how, does, how does Satan open the first two temptations? If. If what? If you're the son of God. Now, we should stop. Does Satan know that Jesus is, in fact, the son of God? Absolutely he does. In fact, every time we, we see, the, see demons respond to Jesus, they're freaked out. They're scared because they know who he is. So Satan is not making a conditional statement about Jesus. He's making a statement about the power of the Son of God. We, oh, Jesus, it, it, okay, so you're the Son of God, so you need to show me that you're the Son of God. He knows he's the Son of God, but what is, he's, he's tempting him to the, the, the level of power of the Son of God. Basically, some translations will, or some commentators will say it should be translated since you are the Son of God. But I think the power of the if is, is, is critical there. Because remember what happens in the Garden of Eden. Remember the temptation in the Garden of Eden. The tempter in the Garden of Eden, the serpent, knows exactly what he's saying is a lie. Did God really say that you must not eat of any of the fruit of the trees in the garden? Did God really say that? Does the, the serpent know what God actually said? Yes, of course he does. So that, that kind of conditional attitude elevates the, the severity of the lie, almost, in my opinion. Now, the first two temptations use the term, if you are the Son of God, or since you're the Son of God. The third implies it. We're going to get to that in, in, just, in just a moment. Um, the irony is that had Jesus fallen to temptation, the very nature of the son-father relationship, um, it would have been entirely upended. We don't want to think about the catastrophic effects of Jesus falling to temptation because it would have been monumental. In John chapter 5, you'll remember that Jesus' authority on earth was given by the Father. He says in verse 9, Jesus says to those who question his authority, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. So, in this instance, the authority of Jesus is based on the adherence to the Father's command. Complete obedience is necessary. So proof of Jesus' sonship was predicated on his relationship to the Father. So the temptation, the, the conditional nature of the temptation is logically inconsistent. He is the Son of God, and he's, he proves that he's the Son of God by his obedience to the Son of God. So if Satan really was asking a conditional temptation, it would have been more like, okay, so if you're the son of God, then do everything the Father says, because that would really prove it. But that's not how Satan rolls. That's not how Satan tempts. He tempts with lies and accusations. Now the first temptation that we see was directly tied to the hunger that Jesus naturally felt after 40 days of 
fasting. Jesus has fasted for 40 days. He is hungry. Remember, fully God, fully man. That's going to become really important in our understanding of how this temptation works. Jesus is fully God and fully man. He needs bread in order to live. Now, this temptation is tied directly to the wilderness wandering of the Israelites. If you look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, the people accuse Moses, and by extension they accuse God, you can see in verse 8, of wrongdoing. They basically say to Moses, why is it that you brought us out of Egypt so that we could die of starvation? When we were back in Egypt, we had meat. We could eat meat by the fire. Now, never mind, we were enslaved and beaten routinely for our indentured servitude, building pyramids and whatnot for a tyrannical king. That was not a big deal. We want our steak. And so they grumble against Moses and against God. And what does God do? God uses this moment to demonstrate his miraculous provision by sending manna from heaven and quail so they could eat. Now, Satan knew it was in God's power and God's character to feed his people. It was in God's power and his nature to feed them. Is God a good God? Yes. Does God want to feed his people? Yes. In fact, the only, one of the only things attested to in all four Gospels, the only miracle attested to in all four Gospels, is what? The feeding of the 5,000. So is God opposed to feeding people? No. But here the temptation is, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to trust? The Spirit had led Jesus to this point, and that was based on the will of the Father. So to listen to Satan at this point would be, as in the relationship to the Lucan arrangement, it was to be tantamount to the failure of Adam and Eve. They'd be, Jesus would be listening to Satan, following his belly, rather than following the will of the Father. Remember in the temptation in the garden, what do Adam and Eve say about the fruit? It is good for food. It's good to assuage their hunger. The rebuttal that Jesus gives to Satan, it comes from, you guessed it, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It calls attention to the quail and manna incident from Exodus 16. Additionally, if you look at John's gospel in John 4 verse 34, Jesus says, my food is the will, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his will. Obey, obedience to the word of God is obedience to the will of God. And that's what Jesus is prioritizing over the rumblings in his stomach. How often does that happen for us? Those who argue that um, this is a temptation to sorcery, there are some commentaries, uh, InterVarsity Press, New Testament commentary, believes this is a temptation about sorcery. I don't think that is very correct. I think that's mistaken. The fact that, Jesus, uh, that Satan is asking Jesus to perform a miracle is not a, the, the fact that he's asking him to perform a miracle is not the big deal. It's who is he listening to and for what reasons. Does Jesus perform miracles? All the time. Does he perform? Now here's a, here's a well, Jesus doesn't perform miracles for his own sake. Well, not, nothing Jesus does is exclusively for his own sake, but he does miracles that really benefit him. He doesn't want to walk around the Sea of Galilee, so what does he do? He walks across the Sea of Galilee. Now, simultaneously, the disciples are shocked at the power of Jesus, and that is huge, but, you know, Jesus has a nice walk across the water as opposed to around the Sea of Galilee. So it's not even that Jesus can't perform a miracle that he benefits from. It's that this is a temptation related to trust and will. It may be stated that Satan is asking Jesus to follow the yearning of his very human stomach rather than the will of the Father in this moment. In that way, you could also tie this, uh, this temptation to that of 
the story of Jacob and Esau. You remember the story of Jacob and Esau? Jacob is the younger brother. Esau is the older brother. Um, how does Jacob get Esau's older brother birthright? Esau comes in after hunting all day, and he's famished. And Jacob goes, oh, you, you want some stew? Oh, I got some, you want some, I'll give you the stew. Oh, just a little thing, you got to sell me your birthright. And of course, Esau does it right then and there. And he loses the birthright and the, uh, the order uh, in which uh, God blesses the sons Jacob and Esau. So, very interesting uh, ties to the Old Testament throughout this first temptation. The second temptation, again, uh, the devil asks Jesus to, say, to prove his divinity, to prove his relationship to the Father. But here, there is a miraculous shift in location. Now, there's a lot of ink been spilled on, well, what is this really? There's, there are no mountains, there are, there are no places in the temple where this could actually take place. And there, there, This is a vision, guys. This is a miraculous vision. doesn't make it any less real. This is a miraculous vision. But it's significant that Satan would choose the, tem the temple as the location of this temptation. What is the temple? The temple is the physical representation of God's presence on earth. When the people of God, the Israelites, when they saw the temple, and before that, when they saw the tabernacle, that was God with us. Not the temple itself, but a representation of, of God with us. You remember the Ark of the Covenant was like the throne of God. So it's ironic that, that Satan would go to the place where the people looked at this, this building and said, okay, God is with us, to take God with us to be tempted, as Jesus is Emmanuel. Um, the temple would also serve as an example, though, of the people's desire to cling to the signs of a relationship with God rather than an actual relationship with God. Thus, you, you read about the destruction of the temple in the synoptics and in the book of John. So, Satan takes Jesus to what is referred to as the pinnacle of the temple or the highest point. It also may be referred to as the wings of the temple in the original Greek. And that would have had particular impact given Satan's reference to Psalm 91. So he actually quotes Psalm 91 in his temptation. Also in Psalm 91, there's this imagery of a mother bird used as, uh, or mother bird's wings used as protection for her chicks as a sign of God's protection over his people. The temptation itself is not that Jesus attempts suicide. Jesus' ultimate mission is to die for the sins of the world, but at the proper time, after the requisite number of signs and teachings have been accomplished, Jesus is meant to die so that he might be resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this temptation is like, okay, Jesus, why not cut to the chase? If, if the Father is going to save you anyway, why not just jump off right now and have him save you? The word Bible commentary points out that such a, an act of jumping from this height would have resulted in the Father's salvation of Jesus. And it's not a matter of public spectacle that is, is necessary here. Again, it's a matter of trust and obedience. Will Jesus trust the timing of the Father in the Father's will? Now, Satan, again, is tempting Jesus, but he ups the ante because he himself begins to quote Scripture as a means to legitimize the actions. Now, that is a pretty laughable way to tempt Jesus, but, but it's a pretty ready way to tempt us. Christians throughout history have used scriptures to support some pretty terrible things. Chattel slavery, genocidal campaigns, heck, the Nazis quoted scripture to get their, their, their agendas across. For Jesus, that's a laughable technique. For us, we have to be very careful. Jesus says, 
to Peter. You remember in, in Peter, uh, in, in, at the end of uh, the Gospels, when they're in the garden, and Jesus is about to be arrested, what does Peter do? He takes out his sword, because he's packing, and he cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus says in Matthew 26 to Peter, Do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send more than twelve legions of angels? But then, how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? So, is Satan wrong? Is Satan wrong that, that angels would save Jesus? He's not wrong, but he ain't right either. This is, this is temptation, guys. This is how temptation actually works. Temptation is rarely outright obvious. It's when it has this note of partial truth that it gets really difficult. Now for Jesus, he, of course, responds with Scripture itself. This is less a temptation about action and, again, more about trust and obedience. The Holy Spirit will raise Jesus from the dead, but the timing and the method of Jesus' death is very crucial to the will of the Father. And that's not lost on Jesus. So he quotes from, again, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The third of the temptations is the most direct and it also represents the greatest challenge to the mission of Jesus. It represents a challenge to his kingship. The mountain location that Satan takes Jesus to, it recalls the moment uh, in the book of Exodus as Moses receives the law. Moses was later commanded to go to the top of Mount Nebo and look over the promised land that he himself would, would not enter. Uh, one of the commentators I read points out that this could also point to what were called the high places. The high places were, the, were, were, were those places where the people of God were off, often tempted to worship false gods. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 2, as an example. And given that the temptation is about false worship, that also seems appropriate. The temptation is what Jesus has offered. What has Jesus offered? He's offered all the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory, including their riches and their power and their influence. What is Satan offering? Satan is offering to make Jesus a king. Again, there's a note of irony. Jesus has already been promised the kingship of being the Messiah. But what is the cost of ascending to the throne? Death on a cross. Death on a cross. Paul, in the book of Philippians in chapter 2, in the great Christological hymn there, he talks about Christ's humiliation before the whole world. And that, that humiliation is the basis for Jesus' glorification. His sacrificial obedience means he is glorified with a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. They will treat him as a king, but he has to go through the cross. The humiliation of the cross. What Satan is offering is a shortcut, it seems. But this begs a very important question. Does Satan have the authority to even offer this? For this to be a real and legitimate temptation, the answer has to be yes. If he doesn't have the actual ability to offer anything, then it's not really a temptation. Jesus could say, well, you got no business doing that. You got no right to do that. This isn't a temptation. But this is a real temptation, because to an extent, Satan has authority, some authority, over the kingdoms, this is the key part, of the world. They are objects, products, filled with sin, often organized with sinful purposes as their modus operandi. Scripture attests to this in several places. I'm going to rattle these off really quickly, guys. John 12:31. John 14, 30, John 16, 11, Jesus himself 
talks about the overwhelming influence of Satan on the world. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, and 2 Corinthians 4, 4, talks about the power of Satan, calling him the prince of the air and the god of this world. Little g God. Because he's given authority to tempt those on earth. He's not in heaven, he's on earth. He's given that authority on earth. But that's the, that's the caveat, right? The caveat is the kingdoms of the world, which are by definition temporary. They're temporary. All the kingdoms of the world are temporary. Babylon, gone. Egypt as a kingdom of any great influence, gone. Rome, gone. Greece as a, as a kingdom of influence, gone. Persia, gone. Temporary. And guess what, guys? The United States, temporary. I know this is like a head-scratcher for most of us, but we're less than 300 years old. A blip on the timeline of history so far. This is contrasted over and over again with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. John the Baptist has already preached about the contrast between the kingdom of heaven and this world. The bulk of Jesus' parabolic teaching, which we've been preaching on for, for weeks and weeks, has been about the king, what the kingdom of heaven is like. At best, at best, Satan is offering a shortcut to temporal, temporary authority. One that doesn't involve the sacrifice and the cross, but one that will also not last forever. This seems to be a shortcut, and the price is idolatry. Um, We've got to stop there. We're going to pick this up next week. We're going to finish this up, and then we will... Uh, We'll move into the rest of chapter 4. Let's pray. Gracious God, uh, we thank you that you are uh, the great um, defeater of temptation. We ask, Lord, that you would move in us that we might also be like you, following the will of God for our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.